uh, can we see the PowerPoint? I have here a study for us of the founding fathers because uh, I thought you might be interested in this because I work with uh, Norberto Kepi, as I said, and this is one of his 40 books uh, analyzing different social questions. And this book is historic. It's called Liberation of the People, The Pathology of Power, because there has never been a book written that analyzes the pathology of certain people that get into power and then make a mess for everybody. It's a specific type of mental illness. You know? <laughs> yeah. You know, there are some obvious people, like how did Adolf Hitler get into power? You know, his first years in office, he was actually helpful to the, the, the socialism there, the workers, the first four years, and then he just started getting more and more crazy. The person begins to vent their pathology. We use the scientific word, you know, their sickness, their mental illness onto the society, wherever they can. And this book is an analysis of this type of uh, pathology. You know, because there's individual pathology, there's social pathology, and this pathology of power, it's the worst type that we have, that we have to deal with. And so, uh, studying this book and working with this science, uh, I found it very interesting in relation to the founding fathers, because they had this perspective that people who get into power, you have to be very careful because they're the worst people in the society. Look, let's take a look. I'm speaking in general, of course there are exceptions, you know. My childhood hero, and until today, personally, is John Kennedy, you know. So this doesn't include everybody. But there are many sick people who get into positions of power. Let's see. So here we can start with Alexander Hamilton, because I've just chosen four of the founding fathers so we can get an idea. This is a scholastic study of all the works that they've written. You know, we've gone through all of their material and to see what they had in common, what they say, what they were worried about, what their concerns were. Because they were living un in, uh, under a despot, the king of England at the time. And they just, in general, they just said, enough of this is enough. They just confronted the situation and they went to found their own nation, another nation. Okay? Using the, the French Illuminist philosophy, if you go to Paris, you see on all the buildings, uh, liberté, uh, equalité, fraternité. Liberty, equality, and brotherhood. And this is a, the, the very basis of our nation, this idea. Now, so let's take a look. I'm not going to go through all of them, but look at number two. Look, men who flatter the people end up being dictators. You know, in other words, men who don't say, speak the truth, don't say what is really the problem, what's really happening, but just flatter, flatter the people. Look at, look at uh, Hamilton's observation here. Isn't that interesting? And, and I found this interesting in relation to the study of the pathology of people who wield power. You know? So, oh, look at number three. Human beings are selfishly egoistic and bad intentioned. You know, they, they had this perception. They have to be careful. The human being is something beautiful in his essence, but he also has pathology. He has bad intentions. You have to be aware of that. You can't just pretend that everything is wonderful. Especially when it comes to positions of power. Look at number four. Look at the idea that they have. It's a constant fight to avoid the uh, predominance of imbalanced individuals. This is no joke. This is what our nation was founded on. Because before the United States was founded, there was no liberty. Do you know that the French were the people who gave us the Statue of Liberty? You know that, right? They said that. Because in the United States, they were um, putting into practice the Illuminist philosophy better than there in France. And they gave us the Statue of Liberty like, man, good luck. Like, if you guys can do it, then the rest of us can follow. Because this, this earth is not a very nice place. Have you ever heard of Satan? Spiritual forces of darkness? You know? Do you know what happened to Christ when he came here? This is not a nice planet. And these founding fathers, they made a constitution to safeguard our liberties so that we can pursue happiness at a place where this never existed. You know? And so you have to be very careful with this. Jefferson said something very interesting. If you want to be ignorant and free, you want what never was and never will be. So this is something very important for us to consider. If we want to keep our liberty as Americans, because we're the only 
nation that achieved a certain degree of liberty. So let's see something of Jefferson here. Next. Look, at look, it's the same type of thing as, as Hamilton. Do you notice? Uh, number two. The worst thing that exists is the self-seeking egoism of monarchs, clergymen, and nobles, who were the powerful of his time. You know, who are the powerful nowadays? Who are the most powerful entities on our planet today? Huh? Corporations are close. <coughs> Yet more powerful than the politicians. The Pope, in, the, in the past, the church was the power of the earth. Somebody said banks. We're getting closer. Uh, enterprises, banks. Well, you know, we say economic power. You know, these guys behind the scenes who, uh, who uh, have, you know, in Kennedy's time, he was working on legislation to, to um, how can I say, control the writ of multinational corporations. Because he, see, he saw that there were entities that had more economic power than the government. He was really worried about that. And that was some years ago, yeah. Now look, number three. Mistakes are preferable to inaction because the indifference of a people is what kills a nation. I'm going to take a little aside here. I'm going to tell us a little story. Uh, once upon a time, before Reaganomics, do you know that the United States became a great nation because the Americans were always the most active people on the planet? This is scientific analysis. You can see in some countries, they're more intellectualized. They like to think about things and analyze things that they don't do very much. You know, like in England, for example. Or there are nations, most of the Latin nations, they like to feel things. They stay in the feeling. You know, you see on the news, they, they like to see people crying and they want to get emotionally involved in things. But Americans are more in the action. And this is the most dynamic element of being of the human being. This is a scientific study of ontology, the study of being. Okay? And so, look, let's see if you can perceive something. Consider this. Uh, when the United States was in trouble in the, in the 70s, having some difficulties with uh, industrial, agricultural. Um, Reaganomics was implemented into the society. And actually it was not an idea of Reagan, it's Milton Friedman. Reagan took it, put it through Reagan. Yeah? And so what was it? Essentially it was to stimulate the stock market, the financial aspect of things. And what happened was, we can see today that, um, for example, uh, industries, they're more, they're more interested in uh, the speculative markets than in producing cars, for example. They make more money in the markets than producing what they manufacture. And so what happens? Well, the cars, they have the same models every year. They're not so good, the cheap materials, because they're more interested in the speculate, money speculation. You see? So the, the industry started, went down. You know, in 1982, just that year alone, there were 34,000 farms in the United States that were closed down. They were not bought up, they were closed down. You know, they were stimulated, to, they were given money to not produce for financial reasons. And so we see that the industrial markets, the agricultural markets, everything started to go down. On a personal level, on the workforce, I have friends who would take their paychecks and invest it in the stock market and started making money, more money there than working. So what are you going to do after a while? You know, just retire. What is retire? You know, just so what happened was the United States was deactivated. I don't know if you can perceive that. It's difficult to perceive because the money was still going. You know, stock markets, money. Everybody has money, but everybody's getting more and more inactive since the '80s until now. In this valley here, not so much. You can see that people still are kind of active. But in other areas of the states, in, in general, you can see that people have stopped. Okay, and this is a problem. Uh, you know, the solution to a problem is first to perceive what is the problem exactly. You know, if you want to analyze the origin of the crisis, you have to see that the United States was deactivated. 
And this was our dynamic. This is why we were the greatest nation on the planet. We're no longer so. Believe me, I've, I've lived in six different countries and I've traveled in many, many more. And I know that there are other countries that have exactly what we have, in certain ways, even better. Because we're losing that dynamic of action. Okay? So this is, I, I'm not trying to chastise anybody or, what, you know, whatever. Uh, evil is evil. But the consciousness of evil is good. Does that make sense? You know, to see the mistakes is something good because then you can adjust if you can perceive what you do. So in a certain way, we were tricked with this question of Reaganomics. Look at number four. <laughs> uh, schools and the public media must be free. That is not controlled by any interest other than their proposed function in order to avoid the corruption and decadence of a nation. You know that the media has been bought up by economic powers, yes? Yeah. You know, this Murdoch guy, uh, they even buy, uh, Murdoch owns NGM and uh, Warner Brothers, they, they've even bought up the cinema. They control the, the <coughs> If you're a person who thinks that the media tells the truth, I'm kind of sorry, <laughs> no, I don't know what planet you're living on. You know, some of us have turned into McDonald's hamburgers or something. You know, not the real thing. These men, they were revolutionary. Let's see the next one. They were not like complacent, inactive. They were absolutely of a revolutionary spirit. Um, Thomas Paine, this guy was very interesting. Intell I mean, intellectual revolutionary. I don't mean these guys who walk with a sword cut them out. Not this type of thing. Um, yes, I had somebody say to me, uh, this book, Liberation of the People, uh, this is revolutionary. You know, and he said it to me as though there's something wrong with me, you know. I said, well, I'm, I'm not as revolutionary as our founding fathers, but, but I'm trying to be. You know, this is what is American. Let's see the next one. Okay, hey, now look at this. It's necessary to reduce authority. That is the accumulation of power to a minimum, so as not to impede the liberty of others. That's why in our political system it's divided up in three parts. Right? This, this never happened before. This was an, an idea of the French thinker Montesquieu, the Baron of Montesquieu, that was um, taken in. Uh, these guys, they used that idea to divide into the judicial, legislative, and executive branches in order to spread out the power. Because if you accumulate power, Forget it, no more liberty. Because of the psychopathology of the human being, this, this question of the pathology of power. They were aware of this at that time. I find this fascinating. Look at number two, look. It's necessary to impede the excessively greedy from exploiting the gullibility of the masses. Do you think this is applicable today? I think we're not so much on the watch. I think we think that everything is uh, uh, going to be fine without taking things into better consideration. Um, look at number three. I have a question for you about number three. It's necessary to prevent a dominating class of any type from perpetually remaining in power. Okay, now in Payne's day, this was the, 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 the monarchs, the nobles, you know, the king of England, you know, and they're there all the time, the same family, they're perpetually, you can't have that. If you have that, you don't have liberty, you know, because they become tyrants and they dominate. And so, my question is, is there anybody today who is perpetually in power? 